This is supposed to be a video about thrift store finds, but I guess I'll share my latest automotive performance enhancement with you. Who knew that driving around with a VCR on the hood of your vehicle could add like 15 horsepower? I sure didn't, but listen to that roar! Oh yeah! <laughs> the neighbors must think I'm completely out of my mind at times. Try not to hit the lamp post. So anyway, with the kind of speed boost that VCR was giving me, man, I might not have as much trouble catching the Key Keeper's White Bonneville. At least not as much as I do now. <laughs> oh, where was I? Oh yeah, thrift store find. Well, I was out hitting the, the various thrift and bric-a-brac stores here in town the other day, and I came across a couple of things that I thought were interesting enough to share with everybody here on YouTube. The first one is this thing. This is a battle tank of a tape machine. This is a Sanyo memo scriber tape recorder and actually came with a tape in it. I can't really describe how heavy this thing is and unfortunately I don't have a scale but I'd say this thing weighs every bit of 10 or 11 pounds no problem. Got a nice oval speaker opening there on the side. Pretty solid bottom panel. It says under license of Star SA Brussels Belgium and licensed by Thomas International Corporation USA. Date code 101281. I don't know if that would be October 12, 1981 or not, but this thing is definitely a beefy tape machine, and as its name implies, it's obviously intended for use as a sort of, uh, you know, record your thoughts on this or record your dictation or dissertation or whatever for probable later typing by a secretary or by yourself or something like that. It actually came with a tape in it. I have no idea what's on it. It's one of those cheap audio branded Walmart cassettes. Although the earlier ones of these that were made in the US really weren't too bad of a tape. The ones that were made in China were just uh, passable. Not, not a real high fidelity tape, but certainly reliable enough for voice capture and stuff like that. Check out the size of that motor in there if you can see it. That motor is massive. That's that silver drum in the back. You certainly wouldn't see a motor like that in a modern tape machine. And like I say, I don't know how good this thing's audio quality is. I'll get to that in just a minute. But as you can see, it has speed control, which I believe is what the licensing notices on the bottom pertain to, because I have a Radio Shack machine with adjustable speed playback, as well as adjustable speed winding and recording, because they're lazy and don't disable the circuit. But I think that's what the licensing notices have to do with. There's also a volume control. Now, I don't see... I don't see an obvious microphone connection on this thing, or, or a built-in microphone. There's a connection for an earphone right there. And then on the back is a sort of DIN plug that says Control. Yeah, it was actually made in Japan by Sanyo. It's the model TRC-8010A. 20 watts worth of electrical power consumed to run that thing, the memo scriber. So anyway, I don't know if I have all the pieces I need to make use of this thing. I know it is found. It will certainly try to play and rewind, but it doesn't succeed. And I'll show you what it does here in just a moment, as soon as I get it hooked up to the extension cord here. Oh, yeah. This thing has a pretty serious cord on it. Look at that. Three-pin electrical plug. Wowee. All right, now as you can just kind of see, I have the power turned on to this thing, and it's plugged into the outlet. This is what's wrong with it. The poor old thing needs belts. Hopefully not an idler wheel, because I don't look forward to doing that. But if I engage any mode, such as rewind or fast forward, I haven't actually tried play, because I'm really afraid that it might result in a tape eating incident. You'll notice there's also an erase button here, the function of which I'm not entirely sure of. But I imagine that it just runs the tape past the uh, erasing head without actually laying down a new signal on top of it. But if I select a tape transport operation here, you see it runs for a moment. Oops, what happened to it then? And it just runs out of steam. It just can't seem to do it. So I would imagine that the belts are bad. There is basically no... If I, if I select the play mode, there is basically no take-up torque to speak of. The thing doesn't have any strength at all. So my guess is that the belts have just turned into useless goo on this thing. So, in order to see what's on the tape, 
I went ahead and brought this thing out with me. I found this at the same thrift store, gave two dollars for it. This is definitely a no-fi cassette recorder. I have one of these in black that's uh, badged as a General Electric model. Apparently RCA still sells this thing today. But I got this thing for two dollars with the batteries in it, and when I first took a look at it in the store it didn't run. And then I discovered something that made me wonder once again if we weren't all simply doomed. The batteries had been put in completely backwards, so as soon as I flipped them around, this thing worked perfectly. I guess I'll use it to see what's on this tape, if anything. Well, all right, I went ahead and gave the tape a quick listen to make sure there was nothing secretive on it, because who knows? You, know, you never know what you're going to find one of these old cassette machines used for, and I certainly wouldn't want to betray anyone's confidentiality or anything like that. But this seems to be just an oral history, uh, an, older, an older man talking about... Uh, members of the family and uh, their predisposition to certain things. So go ahead and I'll just go ahead and give you a quick little listen here. So there you have it, just a little demonstration of the tape that I found in the machine. Obviously it wasn't having speed control problems then. The recording's a little noisy, but it seemed like it did a good job. So I'll put, I'll put some belts in this thing, or at least throw some rubber bands on it, and just see if I can get it into the ballpark. Because like I say, this thing looks like it's just impressively solidly built. It actually has a pretty decent... Uh, the pinch roller looks okay, could use a cleaning. The erasure head is not one of those simple permanent magnets, it's actually driven by the uh, the bias supply coming off of the bias circuit. And I do not know if this is an AC or DC bias machine. Really not sure how to tell you that, other than by looking at the circuit, which I have not done. But there you have it, that's the first of the thrift store finds. Now for the second one, and, and this is cool. This, this brings back some memories of my youth, because Back when, uh, when my mother, before my mother had married or had kids or anything, she worked for uh, General Telephone, GTE, doing uh, phone book layout. Back in the day when phone book layout was actually done by hand, you know, people sitting there and cutting and pasting clip art out of books and things like that. Well, I believe it was as a Christmas gift, they let her pick something uh, to get as a gift, and she picked this red 19-inch Salvania TV, and I'll tell you what, that was such a cool TV. Everybody ought to have a red TV. A red TV is just plain cool. I don't know why, but I like the idea. This was a 19-inch black and white Salvania TV with a red cabinet, black trim on the front, two-knob tuner, one for VHF, and one for UHF channels 14 through 83. Had a silvered volume knob and an oval speaker behind a, a, a rectangular slatted grill. My mother, uh, the TV worked great. My mother eventually donated it to a charity when I was a youngster, and I've never seen another one like it. I'd love to find one someday, but I imagine that, uh, you know, the market for black and white TVs isn't really very good, and if anybody had one, they've probably thought it was worthless by now and smashed it or something, but maybe I'll find one of those Salvania TVs in a thrift store somewhere or something, because I'd really love to really love to recapture that part of my youth. That, it was only a black and white TV, but it, it really, really worked well, and it was new enough that it was fully solid state. I would guess sometime in the, in the early 1970s, something like that. But I found this, and this would certainly be an acceptable substitute because this thing is cool. This is a Zenith portable television set, and it's got some features that I have not often seen on any portable TV. In particular, you can see that it has a fully digital tuner, but even that's not all that unique. What's really unique about this thing is that it's a programmable digital tuner, and it actually remembers its programming. You can see the recessed button there that says Skip. You can also see a button that says Bcast and CATV. That's right, this thing has a cable-capable tuner built into it. The electronics from this thing look very similar to the design that a lot of the uh, late model, I think they were System 3, electronically tuned televisions had. 
I don't remember for sure. I have one down in the basement that's got a bad power switch, but power switch and everything on this looks identical to those uh, table TVs, as do the positions of the tuning buttons, the enter volume channel, and the uh, programming and AFC buttons, and all that neat stuff. And of course, there's the LCD display right there. Yeah, this is a cool find, because not only is this an electronically tuned, cable, ca cable compatible, television, it's also a color television. I was surprised by that. I really did not expect this to be a color set, but look at that. It does have color controls on it. So it must be a color TV set. There's the little speaker in there. I'd say generously that's probably a three inch speaker. Has a built-in antenna. Now it only seems to run off of uh, line power. Unfortunately I have no idea what model it is because the sticker that contains that information came off. Must have fallen off years ago. Maybe some previous owner has it or something. Shoot, I don't know. But it was made uh, by Zenith Electronics Corporation, of course, back when they were still uh, a relatively healthy company. I would guess mid-1980s, 85, 86, somewhere in there maybe, in total absence of a manufacturing date. Now I know that Zenith had a factory in Taiwan where they made uh, portable black and white TVs in the 1970s. But I really think this one may have been assembled in either St. Louis or Chicago. Oh, that's the coolest thing. This, uh, this carrying handle up here is a spring type. So it pulls up when you need it, and you can lift the TV and carry it. And then when you set the TV back down, the handle just snaps away and disappears. But you can always get it back by pulling up here in the corner and then lifting up. This, this is just so cool. So anyway, might as well give you a demonstration of it. The picture tube is in really good shape. There's no scratches or nicks or anything on it. It looks like maybe there was supposed to be... You can kind of see up there. And you can see it better down here. It looks like maybe there was supposed to be some kind of a shield over the uh, face of the picture tube, but it probably got broken many years ago. I have a General Electric portable television that is basically identical to this, but much, much longer. It's the same screen size, basically but it, has, it appears to have a deeper picture tube in it. It also appears to be much more crammed with circuitry. The internal layout of this thing, judging by what I can see through the holes in the top covers, is pretty clean and simplistic. But the General Electric TV that I had had a screen cover until I broke it, <laughs> which was kind of unfortunate. I actually put a star-shaped crack in it, and I have no idea how I managed to pull that off, but it was really unfortunate. One of these days I'll make a video about that General Electric TV because it has a digital tuning system, but it is like no digital tuning system that I have ever seen. Well, this is what the VCR out here is really for. It's not for any kind of performance enhancement, as funny as that may have been. Um, it's actually to put a signal into this TV so I can demonstrate it to you. There you can kind of get an idea of the uh, picture. It's kind of washed out here in daylight. I could probably take this into the garage, but that's like extra work, so. Here's the tuning in action. You want to tune down and you can see this thing is uh, obviously in cable TV tuning mode. But you can also see the uh, programmable aspect of it, how certain channel numbers... Those are pretty much sequential, but certain channel numbers are definitely being skipped. I'll have to reprogram this thing appropriately, although obviously you can't receive any broadcast TV around here now without one of those fiddly converter boxes. And of course you can directly enter numbers in there as well. So I'll go ahead and put this on channel 4, which I think the VCR is set to, and then I'll go get a tape. I am going to have to do the belts in this TAC VCR eventually, this MV375 that was in the kitchen table electronics repair video from a week or two ago. But for right now, a rubber band is uh, definitely getting me through. Well, now here is my bid to irritate the movie and music companies all in one fell swoop. I haven't actually tested this VCR with a television hooked up to it, so this will be the, uh, the maiden voyage here. I know it'll load a tape and go through the right motions. I don't know if it actually works properly, though. Guess I shall find out. Okay, it says play. Well, what's going on here? There we go. The blue screen, at least. That part of the VCR definitely works. Well, let's try fast-forwarding a little bit here. Oh, 
we'll just let it run ahead a little while. Hopefully get rid of all the FBI warnings and crap like that. Alright, go ahead and try that. Well, I've got no video signal, but I've got audio. Maybe this is an audio-only tape, do you suppose? I really don't know. Very interesting. Could be that the heads in this VCR are dirty enough that it can't give a video signal. It's always a possibility, I suppose. Well, let's go ahead and try another tape that I know does have video on it. I used to love this movie as a kid. This is actually one of the uh, few factory recorded tapes you will find that was recorded in the EP mode as opposed to the SP mode. So let's go ahead and wind it forward a little bit here. And let's see if it'll play. Ooh, there are definitely some speed issues there. <laughs> that could be another reason why it hasn't got any video to speak of. <laughs> but the TV seems to work really well. <laughs> All right, there I've got some video out of it now. It's going to need some more work, though. There's no doubt about that. So there you have it. Those are my thrift store finds for late June 2011. It's pretty cool stuff.